Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this uh, today's installment of the Crow Canyon webinar series. I'm Carrie Schlaer, and I'm here today in my role as vice president of the Hisatsunam chapter of the Colorado Archaeological Society, who had originally scheduled this talk with Rob to be, you know, an in-person talk when we when we scheduled it last year. Um, as part of the Four Corners Lecture Series, but we're so thrilled that in these challenging times that Crow Canyon is doing the wonderful online webinars and this talk uh, that by Rob could be added to the online webinar series by Crow Canyon. So today we're going to hear about Chaco's Monumental Roads, New Fieldwork and Insights by Rob um, Weiner. And I first wanted to spend a little bit of time going over how we're able to make this wonderful webinar series happen. A lot of the behind the scenes work happens at Crow Canyon by Dylan Schwint and Taylor Hasbrook. So thank you both so much for all the work you do to make these happen behind the scenes. We also want to have a big thank you to the Colorado Humanities and National Endowment for the Humanities. Funding has been provided by the Colorado Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Securities Act Economic Stabilization Plan of 2020. So we're so thankful for this um, funding to help make us all be a little bit more connected and learn a little bit more about archaeology when we're all, many people are stuck at home and um, people are social distancing. Um, a little bit of logistics for you. Uh, if you're new to Zoom or haven't done a lot of Zoom webinars, um, I want to give you a little bit of background. You can move my head, my talking head over here, Rob's talking head when he starts talking. You can move them around your screen if they're covering something on the slide that you'd like to see. So feel free to do that if, if it helps you be able to see the slide a little bit better. We're also more than happy to take your questions. There is a question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. Click on that and type in your questions. We're going to be saving those till the end, and hopefully we'll get to, to many of your questions. Um, although there's 500 people signed up, so that's a lot. Hopefully 500 people won't ask questions, but we'll, we'll try. We'll try, to get, we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, and if you're having any difficult, difficulties with Zoom, you can head over to our live stream at Facebook Live at facebook.com slash Crow Canyon Archaeological Center. And we hope that you will subscribe to us on YouTube at crowcanyon.org slash YouTube. And you can watch this later on um, on our YouTube channel. And you can also watch all the other uh, great webinars that, that Crow Canyon has been hosting. So the mission at Crow Canyon is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. So we really hope that you'll go find out more about Crow Canyon by going to our website at crowcanyon.org uh, to learn a little bit more about the programs that we're doing at Crow Canyon these days. We have two upcoming webinars that I wanted to mention next Thursday. Another one of the Four Corners Lecture Series talks um, will be about what can we learn from coiling and corrugation in southwestern ceramics with Genevieve Woodhead, which will be next Thursday, August 20th. And then the, the following week, we will be having a talk called Why Do We Call Them Kivas? which will include Dr. Steve Lexon, Dr. Susan Ryan, and Lyle Belinqua. And that's going to be on Thursday, August 27th. And a number of folks have been asking us, as they've seen these webinars, how they can help support people in the Four Corners, and especially Native communities in the Four Corners. So we've come up with a list of a number of different um, funds and organizations that you could help uh, during this difficult pandemic time period. Uh, including the Pueblo Relief Fund, the official Navajo Nation COVID Relief Fund, the Hopi Relief Fund, Navajo and Hopi Families COVID Relief Fund, and the Bluff Area Mutual Aid Fund. So we'd really encourage you, if you're looking someplace, if you have the ability to help and you're looking for somewhere to donate, any of these would be great um, locations to do that. 
So I'd finally like to give a little bit of a background on Rob um, and, and introduce him and, and before he gets going here. So Rob is a PhD candidate in archeology span at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Rob's MA thesis at Brown University examined the archeology span and native oral traditions of gambling at Chaco Canyon. On a larger scale, he is interested in the role of religion as the driver of major transitions in human history and seeks to integrate his research with larger discussions in the humanities to create a better world, which is why it's really great that we get to have Rob as part of this webinar series that's funded by the Colorado Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities. So today we're lucky to have Rob talk with us about his ongoing dissertation research on Chaco Roads. So take it away, Rob. Wonderful. Let me get the PowerPoint shared here. Oh, okay. Okay, did that come up smoothly? Looks nope. good. Great. Well, thank you very much, Carrie. And I want to begin by just extending a very warm welcome to everybody who's taken the time to uh, listen in to this talk. Thank you for being here. Even though we're uh, not together physically, it's wonderful to have this virtual gathering, people from all around the world and all around the nation. Um, so I'm humbled that you've chosen to spend your afternoon together with me here. I also want to thank the Hisatsunome chapter of Colorado Archaeological Society, Four Corners Lecture Series, and of course, Crow Canyon for sponsoring and hosting this talk. Carrie and uh, Taylor have both been very helpful in getting everything set up, so thank you very much. This talk is going to proceed in the following manner. I'll first give a very brief introduction to the archaeology of Chaco Canyon. I imagine most people here are perhaps all too familiar with the debates back and forth of uh, what Chaco Canyon was like a thousand years ago. I'll then give a very slight background on previous research on Chaco and Rhodes, and then launch into four primary areas that my dissertation research focuses. Um, four main questions that my research is oriented around, and draw examples primarily from fieldwork conducted this summer. So I'm very excited to be sharing much, many of these images and much of uh, these findings for the first time. So with no further hesitation, this is Chaco Canyon, located in the center of the San Juan Basin in northwestern New Mexico. As you can see, it's not um, an immediately, uh, you know, very hospitable looking place. There's debates about how uh, how livable it was in the past. Some argue that there was virtually very, very minimal agriculture possible. Others think that there was a uh, moderate amount of agriculture. Um, I, I lean more on the side that Chaco's never been a good place to conduct large-scale farming, but uh, that's a discussion for another day. The point is, you can see here, there are very few trees in Chaco. Um, it's, it's a harsh place to live. It's not, you know, next to a river valley or something like that. And yet, here, ancient people chose to construct massive buildings. For On the screen here, you see Pueblo Benito, the largest building in North America until apartments were constructed in Chicago in the 1800s, something around 800 rooms, four stories, 36 of these circular chambers uh, called today by archaeologists Kivas, which um, you can learn more about in the upcoming webinar that was uh, previewed at the beginning of this talk. Pueblo Benito also has alignments to the cardinal directions, the sun at equinox and the sun at midday. Um, striking monumental building built far beyond the scale necessary for everyday living or uh, contempt, you know, the average dwelling of this time period, Pueblo II time period. This picture is just to show the dramatic cliffs against which the building was set and the thickness of the walls, uh, to emphasize this is built beyond the human scale. Um, these are large monumental structures akin to, you know, more like th more things like pyramids or other sort of massive temple structures elsewhere in the ancient world. I would suggest, again, there's a variety of interpretations. 
There's not just Pueblo Benito and Chaco Canyon, but at least 12 major great houses here in the canyon. As you can see in this image, they're set at a variety of orientations, all of which relates to astronomical azimuths, either positions of the sun at equinox, sun at solstice, or the moon at the major and minor lunar standstills. And these buildings are also laid out relative to one another on these astronomical orientations. So this is a highly designed and planned center of monumentality. And construction was occurring on these buildings from uh, Pelo Benito in the mid 800s through the mid 1100s. So there's multiple centuries of effort being placed into the construction of these uh, wondrous structures in Chaco Canyon. And researchers always come back to this fundamental question of what was Chaco, uh, this is what would, many would call the mystery of Chaco Canyon. They're importing nearly everything. In this image, you see some of the 240,000 roof beams that had to be carried by foot 50 to 75 miles from nearby mountain ranges, the Chuska Mountains or the Zuni Mountains for construction in Chaco Canyon. Large scale importation of utilitarian ceramics from the Chuska Mountains as well. At certain points in Chaco's history, over half the utilitarian ceramics are coming from the Chuskas, I would guess probably filled with foodstuffs. Much of the maize that's been archaeologically sourced from Chaco was also grown in the Chuscas and the characteristic pink-hued uh, Narbona Pass chert that was a favorite of the Chacoans also being brought in from these large distances. And yet, there's no clear evidence for a material export out of the canyon. Chaco has few resources aside from stone to quarry from the cliffs and construct massive buildings. So most, or many, most researchers would agree that it was a very, it was a compelling belief system, a religion, a set of ritual practices that gave people a sense of their place within the cosmos, how the cosmos functioned and kept it functioning smoothly that gave Chaco its draw. You have all this material flowing in and nothing material out except perhaps um, this, these ritual practices that worked. Some might call this a tribute system, others might call this a system of offerings, um, but this is the notion of Chaco as a black hole. Everything's coming in, very little going out. And we'll step out a little further now. It's not just Pueblo Benito we're talking about, it's not just the great houses in Chaco Canyon we're talking about, it is this vast region of about 100,000 square kilometers all across the Colorado Plateau. This is an area about the size of Ohio in which Chaco style buildings, so those characteristic forms of great house architecture appear, especially starting in the 11th century AD, throughout this entire Four Corners region based on these templates developed in the canyon. There's again, you ask different archaeologists, you get different answers. Was this a united sort of empire? Was this a region in which people were uh, sort of knew about Chaco and were emulating what they were doing but not truly connected? Again, I'll just uh, show my hand. I, I, I come down more on the former idea that this was a unified region sharing uh, a single belief system and probably certain material connections as well. But again, that's not uh, necessarily the point of today's talk, but just to show that Chaco style architecture, including the roads, appears across this vast region. So when I talk about Chaco in the title, this is what I'm talking about. Chaco's monumental roads across this vast region. This is just to give a sense of outside the canyon, the great houses can vary from pretty small ones to truly massive structures. This is a site on the Navajo Nation at the Chambers Great House, which you can see is quite massive with a person standing atop it for scale. I'll turn now to a discussion of these roads that are found at many of the dots on the map you just saw, many of the Chaco and Outlier sites. Now, the presence of these monumental avenues in the Southwest has been noted for over a century. Uh, you can see this photo here that appeared in a copy of El Palacio in 1916 of a road near Aztec, New Mexico. It was treated with some kind of a white clay surface treatment that made it very visible. You can see it warps the cart and buggy in the photograph. So there's a sense that Chacoan roads were much more visible on the ground, you know, in the around the turn of the century. 
To give another example of just how visible they were at that time, a man named Bayal, who was Binat, one of the workers assisting Neil Judd with the excavation of Pueblo Benito, is the quote from Judd's account. When asked about the so-called roads on both the north and south cliffs of Chaco Canyon, Bayal, a Dinam man, remarked that they were not really roads, although they looked like them. So even from these early times, we're getting hints that there's perhaps a spurious correlation of form and function with these features. This image here is just showing the the absolute um, or the, the large quantity of these features on the north and south cliffs in the area Bayal was describing. Many, many roads um, right here in that central downtown area of Chaco Canyon. Really a bewildering array that we'll look, we'll give a closer look in just a few minutes here. The traditional way, however, to see Chacoan roads has not been from the ground, but from the air. You can see on the far left image photos from the soil erosion um, survey done in the 1930s, uh, and roads were very, very clear as these dark linear swales running across the landscape. This set of photos shows how their visibility has diminished over the area, eras, and uh, now we're using LIDAR, however, which is aerial laser scanning. We can talk a little bit more about in the Q&A if people would like, um, which makes the roads very, very evident. But so some people were seeing roads on the ground, you know, at the turn of the century. Throughout the 20th century, roads were very visible from the air. And it was because they were visible from the air that the first large-scale roads projects began. These were conducted by the Bureau of Land Management in advance of potential coal leases throughout the San Juan Basin. And these uh, truly incredible reports provide the basis of all subsequent Chaco and Rhodes studies. So the first uh, Chaco Rhodes volume on the left side of the screen here was really proved with, or was really concerned with proving the existence of these features. Are they actually prehistoric, pre-Columbian or not? There was a lot of skepticism. So the, the BLM team did an incredibly thorough, detailed and nuanced job doing things like counting every rock larger than the size of a pea, you know, across the proposed road alignment and looking to see how many had caliche exposed on the surface, suggesting they'd been excavated and tossed aside in the creation of a road. Um, mapping, uh, documenting linear sherd scatters, and uh, of course, doing the aerial reconnaissance. And in the first project, they focused primarily on four roads and giving them a very close look to say, yeah, these things are real. The North Road, the South Road, um, and the Ashi Slepa Road. In phase two of the BLM project, it was less in depth and more wide ranging. The team, Fred Niles, John Stein, John Roney, and others were concerned with visiting the locations where roads had previously been noted from aerial photographs and giving them a first look on the ground, uh, an initial assessment. Either we can definitely see this thing or it deserves further research or we're not really sure or this is definitely historic. So that's, there have been some studies in the subsequent decades, but really that's where Chaco and Rhodes research left off was with these two major projects. And going through the Rhodes Volume 2 um, BLM document, there are many places where it's noted this road deserves further attention, this road should have a second look. I know sometimes the team was out at a site for a day, they had to really keep moving and they couldn't give the attention that these that is really needed to give a very close look at these features as was done in Phase 1. So incredible work with that has opened the door for much Chacoan roads field work in upcoming centuries. So the main findings of the BLM project were not just that the roads existed, but that can be encapsulated in this wonderful phrase used by Anna Sofer and Mike Marshall in a paper about the North Road that Roads appear overbuilt and underused. To quote from the BLM project, it was determined that the sites found along road alignments appeared to be the product of only extremely casual use. You don't have campsites, you don't have parts, you don't have large sort of villages alongside roads, which is puzzling, especially given the way we conventionally think about roads in the contemporary world or in the Western world. Often associated with roads were features known as heraduras. These are crescent-shaped masonry structures resembling um, 
shrines, often with ceramics broken around them. Another finding was that roads ignore topographic obstacles. In many cases, they seem very concerned with maintaining that straight linear trajectory. If they come to a cliff, they'll go straight up or down rather than around, as you would see with a historic road. Um, often it was found the roads were fragmentary. What might um, appear on a map today, if you go through the Chaco literature as a long continuous corridor, in fact, consists of many short broken segments with gaps in between. In many cases, a road just begins as a short spoke and continues no further. We'll see uh, a number of examples of this in the material I will turn to shortly. And especially as driven home in a pioneering paper by John Roney in 1992, it was shown that the Chaco roads do not, in their current surface manifestations, form a network. It's, and, and so I often hear the use of the term the Chacoan road network, and that's not something we truly have evidence for. Um, we can talk more about have they vanished, et cetera, but I'll show some thoughts about why I think a lot of these gaps on Chacoan roads are truly real gaps, and they were often not formalized along the entire line. So with that uh, brief and sort of rapid fire background, I'll now turn to sharing some of the initiatives I've been working on as part of my dissertation research at University of Colorado Boulder. I'm focusing around uh, four questions, but I phrase them here as four theses, uh, which we'll explore each with examples pulled from this summer's fieldwork. So the first is that thesis I'll propose is that not all roads are the same. Often we're reading the literature on Chaco Canyon and there's discussions of Chaco and roads this and that. But what I've found is there are many different types of roads that surely serve different purposes and had different meanings throughout the many centuries that the ancient culture of the Four Corners was constructing uh, these monumental road features. My second assertion, again, not totally new, but deserving much closer look, is that not all roads are Chacoan. We've been finding roads that well predate the emergence of, of multi-storied masonry, great house architecture in Chaco Canyon. And we're finding roads that extend well beyond the so-called collapse in, in the cessation of building of uh, massive structures in Chaco Canyon itself. So um, this might mean we should rethink the concept of Chaco in. Um, again, a, a big debate we could get into, but that's in brief roads are before and after the height of this uh, Chaco fluorescence. Third thesis is that roads cannot be fully understood from remote sensing. I mean in no way to denigrate uh, the use of aerial photos and LIDAR. In fact, we employ it, uh, these technologies frequently in, in my dissertation research, but what I've, what's become very clear to me is we miss many aspects of roads when we don't take a slow, close, nuanced look at them on the ground. It's especially by looking at roads on the ground, we can begin to approach, what are people doing on them? How are people using roads? Which, in my understanding, is key if we're going to approach understanding what they meant and, and what they were, why people were creating them in this Chaco time period. Finally, my last assertion is that road, Chaco and roads cannot be fully understood as roads. We bring a lot of baggage, interpretive baggage, from the modern world about roads being used for transportation, and trade of goods and efficiency. And as I pointed out in a slide a moment, a few moments ago, much of the evidence from studies of Chaco and roads do not accord with those understandings. So I'm gonna suggest in this final part of the talk that by looking more closely at the traditional knowledge of descendant cultures, the Pueblo people and the Diné people, and looking at monumental symbolic roadways from other cultures across the ancient world, we can begin to approach a closer approximation or we'll at least have more tools and more ideas to work with in trying to approach these ancient Chaco features. Before I proceed any further, I want to give a quick shout out to the two gentlemen shown here in the photo. These are uh, the two people who have taught me so much about Chaco and Rhodes and without whom this research really would not be possible. That's Rich Friedman and John Stein, both of whom who have studied Chaco and Rhodes for decades and are truly uh, have Jedi-like powers in seeing these things on the ground, seeing them in remotely sensed uh, imagery. And they've 
really just been so generous, generous and um, supportive that I, uh, I have to give a real shout out and a real word of gratitude to Rich and John before uh, proceeding here. I can only hope one day to have any slight approximation of the road knowledge or uh, skills at, at um, seeing them on the ground that, that John and Rich have. Okay, we'll start with thesis one. Not all roads are the same. So we're gonna look at a few sites where I've been working for my dissertation research to explore this idea. This is a site called Kim Nijoni. It's located pretty close to Grants, New Mexico. You can see it's set in a uh, location with a dramatic vista to um, Salt Sil or uh, Mount Taylor, set there looming on the horizon. It's a, uh, there are actually two great houses in this area. This is an imagery, uh, this is an image um, derived from a drone flight over the site. And as you can see, the roads pop out really clearly. We can see at least five. And there's a couple more actually on this image that I haven't marked, but see the great house here. And we have roads seen in the aerial image and confirmed on the ground in all of these locations. There's also one uh, climbing up the mesa top here. And what are these roads doing? Well, if you get down on the ground and you follow these alignments and you keep your eyes up, what you see is these roads are aligning and pointing to, but they're addressing prominent features on the horizon, whether that would be Mount Taylor, Bandera Peak, the Zuni Mountains, or just, uh, as far as I know, an unnamed trapezoidal uh, peak, just uh, peaking over the near horizon. So in many cases, these roads do not go far from the site. You follow the alignment out, there's a clear signature, there's a shirt scatter, there's other evidence, vegetation patterns, and then they'll come to perhaps a small two-room building and just end. So it seems like one type of road starts at a gray house, it shoots out, and it's addressing something on the landscape, it goes about as far as it needs to go to make it clear what it's pointing to or um, honoring or aligned with, and then it stops. John Stein has used the term formalized alignment for these types of roads, which I think is a fantastic phrase that uh, more accurately describes what they're doing. But not all the roads at this site are doing that. If we look on the east or the right-hand side of this picture, we see one road that's heading due east. That road continues for a number of miles continuously on, on a trajectory towards the San Mateo Great House. So that would seem to be a road linking two contemporary great house sites. And the road heading down to the southeast there, while on an alignment towards Sotsit, is also connecting upper Kinnijoni with lower Kinnijoni, which is a slightly earlier great house in the same complex. So you've got at least three different kinds of roads at the site. Let's take a closer look. This is standing from on top of the Upper Kinijoni Great House Mound. And if you look on this perspective, you see here marked with a very nice vegetation pattern, a road that's very clearly addressing where the Zuni Mountains are peaking out over the near horizon. Again, we return this image. Now we're going to walk or fly or travel along that southeast road on the alignment to Mount Taylor. It takes us to this building, which is uh, called Lower Kinijoni. Uh, to me, it appears clear this building itself is also dramatically addressing um, Mount Taylor. Uh, the road takes you here on the same alignment. Then there are three or four roads that spoke out from Lower Kinijoni, but if you follow the one that continues on that alignment towards Mount Taylor, it takes you to this location where it appears to end, could not be traced further. And at this location, a little hard to see in this photo is a crescent shaped arrangements of rocks, might be called a Herodura, might be called a shrine, opening again very directly and very dramatically onto um, Mount Taylor there. So the site is clearly addressing Mount Taylor and many of the roads are, uh, I don't know what the right, addressing or asserting relationships with prominent features on the horizon. And we know from many indigenous cultures in the Southwest and really around the world that mountains and landforms are often considered the homes of deities or repositories of spiritual blessings. 
So that's one possible way to understand why these roads are addressing these features. For a completely different uh, road experience, we'll look at the uh, what's known as the Great North Road that heads, not surprisingly, due north out of Chaco Canyon. The North Road is often thought of as a long, continuous corridor. I'll show that that is actually not the case. There are gaps that I truly think are not um, erosion, but actually just it does not appear the road was formalized along its entire length. You can see here, though, in many places, it does have a very clear aerial signature with deep swells. This is what the North Road looks like among, along much of its uh, length on the ground. This is a pretty deep swale in an area fairly near to Pierre's complex, for those of you familiar. Um, so you'll go through deep swales like this on the dunes. And then in other places, the road has no uh, formalization. I'm standing on the road alignment here, confirmed by aerial imagery and GPS, and definitely on the road, but there's no, there's nothing marking that you're on the road here, except that white band of exposed uh, cliff side directly ahead. So I, I wonder if on some parts of the road it was highly formalized for whatever reason. And in other parts of the road it was known, perhaps through a song or just those traveling new, you know, aim for the place where the white is exposed in the cliff, and then you go there and then you get some formalization, et cetera. But there's, there's no reason why sherds wouldn't, you know, have stayed on the surface here or any formalization. Uh, there's places on the road where you're walking and it's highly formalized and then you're in the same type of ge geological setting and all the formalization is gone. Luckily, along many or some segments of the North Road, you have scatters and often in some cases, very dense scatters of broken ceramics. They're often very small pieces. They're definitely not pot drops. One of the initiatives I'm working with in my dissertation is a close analysis of the types and the forms and the sizes of the ceramics in these shirt scatters along the North Road. Um, seems to parallel a, a practice that there's a some would argue was taking place in Chaco Canyon, particularly at the Pueblo Alto Mound of intentionally shattering ceramics, perhaps as a practice of offering. So in some cases you are following these dense ceramic scatters for maybe 300 yards and then they're gone. Nothing has changed about the geology, but the, the dense ceramic scatters are gone. So there's differences in the we should be thinking about why, why are they breaking pots on this part of the road, but not back here and not up there. This is just to give you a sense of the, the size that these are often broken. They're very standardized size pieces. They might be breaking them to a, a specific size and they're often on the later side. A lot of, you get a lot of Chaco McElmo on the north road. So the road passes through a number of uh, dramatic sites with uh, Fire boxes set atop towering pinnacles and great houses on buttes at Pierre's complex to rather uh, humble, you know, six, ten room structures at places like Halfway House or just the remnants of a burnt Hakal structure. Uh, we don't have time to look at all of those, but the North Road ultimately leads you here. This is, again, right on the road alignment where it enters Kutz Canyon, which has, as you can see in this photo, dramatic Badlands topography, which is especially striking and shocking after the road um, passes through mostly sagebrush flats and Kutz comes on very suddenly. Uh, atop this low hillock here is um, remnants of a couple masonry uh, rectangular outlines and the small pile of rocks, as you can see with, a, with these snow-capped mountains looming beautifully on that same due north alignment. In uh, the wonderful Solstice Project documentary film, The Mystery of Chaco Canyon, there are um, some, some wonderful quotes from, from contemporary Pueblo people about potential understandings of the importance of that direction north as the place of origin and Kutz Canyon as perhaps relating to a place of emergence or a lower world. The road does descend into Kutz Canyon. Um, this is the location of a wooden stairway documented by Mike Marshall and Anna Sofer in the 1980s. As you can see, it's a very steep and again, sort of dramatic descent. Um, 
as we'll get to in, in thesis number three, this is an example for me of the importance of getting out on the roads physically, uh, being on them to see that, you know, I think this image right here seriously strains notions of, uh, say, timber transport along the North Road. I don't think you would carry, you know, massive beams up a stairway like this. The road er, then has entered Kutz Canyon and there's debate, but most would agree it then travels down Kutz, passes Twin Angels and eventually ends up at Solomon and then Aztec ruins. So here again, we have a road relating to landforms, but it's also connecting great houses and it looks long distance, but it's not formalized along its entire length. And again, it's addressing a direction north. So not the short spokes of Kinnijoni, but it's taking elements of all the road associations we saw at Kinnijoni on a longer scale. And perhaps most bewildering of all about the North Road is how it begins. We see here the so-called fan around Pueblo Alto in, uh, on North Mesa in Chaco Canyon, where there's this bewildering array of alignments that are all prehistoric um, in nature. Uh, some of them converge on this so-called external plaza. Some continue alignments from within the architecture or within the mound here. But from this, I mean, what's going on here? We've got spokes and some of them turn into the North Road. And this is a location we're also working, I'm also working with in my dissertation because uh, it's, I, I feel like this is a sort of elephant in the room. Like, why are there so many overlapping spoky roads around Pueblo Alto? It's, People either don't believe the image or just we don't try and think about what, what are they pointing at or how are they being used and uh, what's going on. So this is to say the North Road is even more interesting and complex than, than we might think. There's even some more recent findings. Of, I mean, the BLM found parallel routes. There's more recent findings suggesting even more than parallel routes, perhaps crisscrossing routes and even perhaps multiple uh, North Roads. Okay, turning pages yet again. We're going to look at the Dittert site. This is located in the southern portion of El Malpais. Um, on the later end, some would say it's a post Chaco site. Some would say Dittert itself is a Chaco era building. There's questions about the tree ring date. It only came out of a single room. It doesn't have corn veneer, but I don't think great houses necessarily need to have corn veneer. Again, we can debate and talk about this all day, but what we're going to look at is the fact that there are roads at the Dittert site. So you see the Great House right here. You've got one road shooting north, sort of northeast, and another road shooting to the northwest that takes an interesting loop detour. So we will start with this north-northeast road, which leads you to this structure. It's again um, just a few rooms, certainly fewer than ten, uh, single story. No midden to speak of, no evidence, no clear evidence of ash or even large quantities of, of refuse. Um, the road takes you here, and as far as we can tell, it stops. We find a lot of buildings like this along roads, multiple room things that resemble unit pueblos but do not have standard signature of a midden or uh, any seeming evidence that they were used much, as the BLM said in that quote. It seems like many sites along roads saw only extremely casual use. This is walking back from that structure towards the Ditter Great House. You can see the road has a nice scooped out clear definition here. And as you continue, this is where it intersects the back corner of Ditter. And again, you've got a great alignment of the peak over the Great House. So working with landforms and leading to these sort of small enigmatic structures. We will now take a travel along this northwest road and its associated loop. Uh, the road comes through here. Again, it's really a grand avenue with a deep uh, swale expression. It leads you, first, you come on the right to the, this remnants, that four outlines of, uh, if, if it was a structure, it certainly was not heavy on the masonry unless the masonry was uh, robbed. Maybe it was adobe, the outline of three or four rooms that look likely to have been burned. And this is where the road forks and creates a loop. And it loops around this structure. Again, you've got maybe 10 or 12 rooms without any serious masonry component, slightly mounded, but very little masonry. There's a large uh, 
sort of P3, Pueblo 3 period, um, Great Kiva or Dance Plaza in this section that the road loops around with two of these enigmatic 10 room buildings without middens. And then that loop returns to the main road. So we've got a whole different picture here, roads that may perhaps are addressing landforms, but there's nothing too clear we see on the ground, but instead connecting with small enigmatic structures and in one case, even encircling. And we could go on and on and on with the diversity of road forms. On the left, you see a, a Chaco outlier where there is uh, Pueblo Pintado, where there is an alignment to the summer solstice sunset, very clearly expressed. We were there in a year um, with great vegetation definition of the road. And I think there's my mind, no question that that uh, road has a solstice alignment. The sun, interestingly, is setting over Chaco Canyon, where the road ultimately leads. And on the right hand here, you see the Holmes Group lo located in the La Plata Valley, where there's uh, a circle road encompassing multiple great houses and multiple great kivas that's intersected by a linear road that comes in right between the great houses. You've also got at least three or four roads that we've ground examined coming up um, the slope here. And you, this, this here looks like, a, of course, has seen historic reuse, but this uh, its ground signature makes it clear it's a Chaco road too and provides a grand promenade uh, with multiple great kivas along it. So you've got roads doing, I hope to have shown, roads are doing many different things. Sometimes they're connecting sites across time. The time bridge idea is something I didn't mention. At Kinijoni, we see two great houses from different periods connected by a road and that's well known. Um, from the work of John Stein and Andrew Fowler as well. We have astronomically aligned roads, roads aligning to topography, circular roads um, from many different time periods. And uh, I'm trying to get at the nuance of what roads are doing in these different cases to show that they're not a monolithic entity. Next point is that not all roads are Chacoan. Again, we could get into a long discussion of what's meant by Chaco. Um, again, I tend to uh, I think there's very strong evidence, especially as shown by John Stein and Andrew Fowler, that there's a lot of continuity at sites in the four corners from the Bascomaker three period through the Pueblo three period. And that what we see as a very unique event in Chaco may be uh, one era's expression of ritual architecture of a continuous cultural sequence that um, just had different iconic architectures in different eras. We can, you know, we can talk about this all day, but the point is, these are two sites I'm investigating as part of my dissertation. These are both located in the Chuska Slope region um, on the Navajo Nation, west of Chaco Canyon. And both these sites are basket maker three pit house villages where there are clear monumental roads articulating with the pit houses. Um, the one ascends the mesa top here, and it's very hard to see in this lower photo, of course, but We've seen, there's also an example of roads articulating with Baskin Maker 3 architecture on the South Road that we're investigating. So it would, it would appear this road making tradition might have preceded certainly the Pueblo 2 period. We know of many Pueblo 1 roads as well, but um, may have even emerged concurrent with the idea of the Great Kiva in the Baskin Maker 3 period. Um, so we have roads before Chaco. Roads might be the longest lived element of the um, ritual landscapes of the Four Corners if they're appearing at Basket Maker Three sites and we have them all the way through to late Pueblo Three um, sites as well. This would be an example of a Pueblo Three site with no um, as traditionally defined Chacoan component. This is on the um, on Chakra Mesa, a, a maybe. 20 miles or so east of Chaco Canyon. You have a large Pueblo Three grade house located here. And as you can see in this aerial photo, a road with a very clear signature, it comes to the cliff edge and forks. One fork leads back to this enigmatic uh, structure consisting just of burnt hakal with a lot of artifacts around it. You have again, some small sites uh, looking like unit Pueblos that do have pretty substantial mins with them lining either side of the road. But the road continues across the mesa top through the sagebrush. Um, it's actually pretty easy to see this photo, not <laughs> made clear in this photo. You come to the edge of the cliff and this is your view. It's a dramatic drop off. There is a way to climb down though. Uh, 
I don't know if Mark Bixby is listening, but if so, shout out to Mark, who's a great rock climber and helped coach me down the cliff to look at what was below. Because where the road drops off, you have a Pueblo 3 cliff dwelling right here. And all of these features, the roads alignment and the cliff dwelling are all looking out and facing something very distinctive and striking on the opposite cliff face, which are these paired alcoves, almost looking like eyes. For those who have visited the Casamero outlier in Pruitt, New Mexico, uh, know that that site is set in front of a striking natural feature that looks much like this. So it would appear this road is, is connecting a great house and a cliff dwelling, but it also seems very clearly to be addressing the striking um, feature. There's nothing else like this on that opposite cliff face. And in, in one of the alcoves is a towering spruce tree um, on a pinyon juniper mesa top, which uh, I reckon could be a thousand years old. And even if it's not, it's really cool today. Returning back to the, so if we were to go back to the great house and continue the road alignment out the other side of the reservoir great house, you would descend along these cut steps. This is a feature known from a number of Chacoan roads, cutting the small steps about foot size, clearly not needed to descend the slick rock here, clearly with some kind of high sign value or symbolic meaning. These cut rock steps take you down to a pecked groove in the slick rock, first noted by John Roney when he documented this road. Again, pecked grooves are known on a number of Chacoan roads at, for example, Coyote Canyon on the South Road, uh, the North Road, uh, where it on North Mesa, and this that line marks it, and it leads on the marks the pecked groove, and it leads you to this rock formation where there's a striking large spiral petroglyph, and there's no trace of the road beyond here. Uh, I don't have a good photo of it, but standing from this spot, you look out and due east on the horizon is one place that you can see Redondo Peak, which we know has such major importance to the indigenous peoples of this region. Redondo Peak is just peeking over the horizon right there, only when you get to this spiral pressure. So very, again, we're working with landforms, symbolic collaboration with steps and um, pecked grooves, and then the paired alcoves on the other side. So that's to share the notion that roads are definitely being built after the height of Chaco and well before as well. I turn now to a discussion of this thesis that roads cannot be fully understood from remote sensing. Again, I don't mean to disparage remote sensing at all. It's really what makes road research possible. But instead, I want to point out some of the things we miss by not giving these things a close and um, detailed look on the ground. This is just to celebrate remote sensing for a moment. These are images from a uh, paper Rich Friedman, Anna Sofer, and I put out a few years ago. This shows how using LIDAR, again, aerial laser scanning, you can put the data in a digital GIS environment, change the angle from which the light source comes, and roads appear and disappear based on where the light is. And you can use light angles that never would have been present in nature, like the sun coming from due north. So this road, for example, is one that with an east-west angle, you, uh, you cannot see. So you can find roads that would not be otherwise detectable thanks to remote sensing and uh, emerging technologies. Similarly, this is another example from the, that paper showing that um, there's sections of the North Road with parallel alignments where you can never see them on the ground. This road has nine and a half centimeters or about three inches of vertical relief across nine meters, 30 feet. So again, because of the digital environment, the only reason we can see this, this quickly gets into the territory of philosophy. Of, you know, if is a road a road if you can't see it? Or was this a road before? It's kind of like the tree falling in the forest. Um, but I got to really give a shout out to Rich Friedman and Anna Sofer, who were working with LIDAR back in 2010. Um, they were ahead of the curve and their uh, pilot study along the North Road showed that this really is uh, a crucial and incredible tool for roads research moving forward, especially because these things are disappearing so quickly, as I'll touch on in this talk. Uh, there's also the potential to use drones to, uh, to perform what's called structure from motion SFM photogrammetry, which is a drone taking lots of pictures that can be then run through a computer program to create 3D models or digital surface models like we saw um, from the LIDAR. This is an example from the Holmes group. Again, uh, this is just a picture of Rich, I think, 
think in his happy place, uh, flying his drone. And we can see the hoop road here. And again, that long linear one coming out. So remote sensing is an absolutely necessary tool, but we then need to get out on the ground and look at these things to get a sense of how they're being used, how might people move along them, what are they doing? I think one of the clearest examples of this is what's called, or are what is what are called, um, well, we don't have a good name for them. Road gates, uh, road walls, John Stein and Rich and others have noted these in the past, um, but they're single course masonry alignments that go across the uh, width of a Chacoan road and block it. Often they have a small little passageway. This one seems like it almost has a sort of you come in here and make a turn and keep going. That one at Pueblo Pintado here at Kenya'a, you see very clearly it's just a single course of masonry. I mean, this wouldn't stop anybody. It's clearly some kind of a symbolic boundary or a marker or a way that um, access was regulated and movement along Chacoan roads was very uh, carefully curated. Um, so from remote sensing, we would have no idea about the fact there's single course masonry alignments blocking roads. And what do they mean? What can, what can we learn from these features? What do they tell us about Chacoan roads? You have another excellent example here at Kinnijoni where there's a road that comes down like this. Again, it has this alignment to that uh, prominent trapezoidal peak. We saw there was a road pointing towards at upper Kinnijoni and where the road comes in to the great house, which is to the left of this image, you've got, again, the single course masonry wall blocking the alignment. We see this too, this is a site Again, west of Chaco on the Navajo Nation, Bass Lake, where there's a, again, this is a slightly bulkier road gate, which comes to here. There's a small gap, and it goes here, and then you've got a large great house over the side, and uh, the great Rich Friedman standing in the road alignment for scale. You can also see what a wonderful vegetation pattern the road had this year, or last year. Finally, uh, another element we miss from remote sensing are these practices of seemingly intentionally shattering pottery along roads. Again, as I mentioned earlier, you get really small pieces. Um, they're clearly not pot drops. You don't find refits. So one of the things I'm looking at in my dissertation, we've, there's a section of the North Road where within less than 500 meters, we have almost a thousand sherds that we've uh, found the type, form, and measured to try and get a sense of, is this, uh, you know, refuse from a midden that's being carried out? Are people, um, how do these assemblages compare to great houses, to unit pueblos, et cetera, to determine what's up with this practice of breaking shirt? Are there differences in the types of shirts broken on different roads or on different sec sections of roads? So it was a very quick um, initial foray into this question I've shown here. This is a chi-square analysis. I, again, don't want to take too much time. Uh, but for those who are statistically inclined, you'll know what it means. These are um, blue shows positive values, red shows negative values. And so you see an interesting pattern emerging here on the uh, quantities of different types of sherds at different locations along roads as compared with what you would expect just by the breakdown of the assemblage. So you see, for example, at road-related great houses, there is more utility wear than you'd expect and less decorated wear. In contrast, to both Herodura, what I'm calling here shrines and stairs, where you have much less utilitarian pottery than you would expect based on the composition of the assemblage, and instead, greater quantities of decorated ware. Similar pattern here, where you have great houses and shrines and stairs with inverse signatures of each other. Again, it seems like the perhaps more valuable wares, the intrusive or imported wares are being broken and deposited at these, high, these symbolically charged locations of shrines and stairs. And perhaps great houses have more activities uh, consistent with you know, cooking going on in them. So this is a, basic, uh, a quick example of the kinds of questions and patterns that may begin to emerge as we look at what, what kind of artifacts are on roads and what is their context. Finally, we'll turn to, see how I'm doing on time here, like we're uh, wrapping up. Turn here to thesis four, the notion that roads cannot be fully understood as roads. As I mentioned earlier, we hear the word road and we bring a suite of uh, ideas with us about what that means, just based on our world. Roads are for transportation, they're 
portrayed, they're efficient, they're features related to efficiency. But what I wish to um, suggest here in thesis four is that by considering the perspectives and traditional knowledge of descendant indigenous cultures of the Southwest, as well as comparative examples of monumental roadways from ritual sites across the ancient world, we can expand our interpretive frame for trying to glimpse uh, ideas of what these, how these features might have been used, what they might have meant in the ancient Southwest. So I'll begin by sharing some uh, traditional knowledge from Diné and Pueblo people about the concept of roads. In, in short, for both, uh, for many indigenous Southwestern cultures, roads would appear to be a central uh, concept used to understand life. Uh, I can, you know, I'm not going to read all of these quotes here, but for example, there's one published version of the Diné origin story where it uh, talks about the hero twins. This takes place just north of Chaco Canyon at um, Zifnal Difle or uh, Puerfano Peak. And the hero twins noticed a glint of a rainbow laying like a rope on the earth. They walked on it. And as they walked, they started flying faster than eagles. They were walking on a team diini, the holy trail created by the holy people or the deities. So there's a notion of a, a holy road or a divine road due north of Chaco Canyon represented there. We also have in, in sand paintings, uh, roads commonly depicted. You see in the example on the left, the footprints, and these are often said to represent the road of life or the trail of safety. This notion that a road might be something that protects a person or brings healing for somebody. This concept is borne out as well by something shared by Diné people living in the vicinity of Chaco and Roads at the time of the BLM projects who shared that the roads were trenches or tunnels which allowed the Anasazi or early Navajo to conceal themselves from giants as they traveled in San Juan Basin. Uh, so again, clearly uh, this, these few examples of how roads are thought about provide a, um, a different way of thinking perhaps than what we immediately bring to roads as efficiency and transportation. There's many, many examples from uh, ethnographies of Pueblos, uh, interviews in the Mystery of Chaco Canyon about um, contemporary Pueblo thinking about roads. I just have a couple quotes here. One is from Ed Ladd from Zuni, who shared in a, in a chapter that the Zuni believe everyone carries within himself his own personal life road, and that he shares the notion that every person's road has its sort of uh, attendants or watchers over it. And then there's a also a notion that in, in many uh, ritual doings or happenings that spirits or sacrosanct persons have a road of cornmeal or pollen. That specific word of road is used to call in um, a, a spirit being or another important uh, entity. There's also the notion from uh, shared by Alfonso Ortiz, the great Tewa anthropologist, that in Tewa, one of the words for road translates as channel for the life's breath. So we have here a whole variety of notions of the importance of the, the concept of roads, both perhaps literally and um, as, as a way of understanding the world in the descendant cultures of the Chacoans. And if you're interested in more of these associations, I would suggest looking at the, uh, the paper on the Great North Road by Anna Sofer and Mike Marshall. It's available on the Solstice Project website or checking out the Mystery of Chaco Canyon documentary where uh, Pueblo some Pueblo people share in their own words uh, their um, understandings of Chaco's North Road. I also think it's quite helpful to look beyond the Southwest to consider what monumental roadways are like and used for in, in uh, across the globe. So this is an example of a Maya Sock Bay. Um, there, sock bays or sock bayob in the plural have a variety of, uh, they do a variety of things from Maya society, but frequently they connect different parts of a settlement to the ceremonial core, where the temple would be, where the pyramids would be. And from contemporary Maya culture, there's a wide variety of associations, again, related to um, spirituality and healing of this concept of roads. There's also on one sarcophagus of a, of a Maya king, the term used to say he died is the term um, he entered the road. So clearly a rich symbol in Maya society and constructed um, massively. 
In ancient Egyptian temples, there's almost always formalized avenues leading in and out of the, the temple complex. Frequently, these were used when the deity statue, which the day, which I don't want to say embody the deity, but the deity could truly inhabit that statue, had to travel along a special pathway. And so these processional avenues in and out of Egyptian temples were extending that sacred space of the temple beyond for the movement of a very important um, entity. Here's Stonehenge. Some people may be cringing, some people may be celebrating, uh, but I bring it up to show clearly uh, a ritual site well known uh, across the world and it has a massive avenue leading into it. So there seems to be this worldwide pattern that you must channel movement into these important sites. I think this is probably what's happening at many of the great houses as well. The sacred space or the defined space of the great house complex is being extended outward, at least in some cases. There's also the example I've been reading about of the Akitu festival, which was a year, New Year's festival in Babylon, at which time um, Deities, again, which inhabited these cult statues from nearby settlements, came to Babylon. They were actually had their own guest quarters set up in some of the Babylonian temples. But I bring this all up to say that there was special infrastructure constructed for these deity statues on their visit to Babylon at the time of the spring equinox or the new year. There were specially created roads along which these deity statues had to travel. So again, you know, to our, on our first reaction, we may think it's sort of out there to think about creating infrastructure for spirit beings or um, divine statues or other, uh, you know, creating infrastructure for the purpose of aligning to a very important landform. But I share these comparative examples from the ancient world to show that, in fact, much of the infrastructure um, in many ancient societies related to um, dimensions that in our contemporary society are not as recognized or we don't create infrastructure for in many cases. Finally, I share the example of the Seque lines of the Inca Empire in Peru, all uh, emanating from or converging upon Cusco, where of course is the, the center of the action. And Seque lines were not truly constructed in many cases, but they, they were conceived of as these sort of sun ray-like alignments that shot out from the sacred center to connect with what were called wakas. Wakas in Inca society were, for lack of a better term, repositories of uh, power or spiritual blessing. It could be anything ranging from a rock to an ancestral village to an exposed uh, fossil bed, to an astronomical direction. They were important, uh, powerful places and things. And there was a conceptual system of lines radiating out from Cusco um, towards these sources of power. And I think, in especially the case of the formalized alignments, like what we saw on the western side of Kinijoni, something very similar may be evidenced in the Chacoan roads. They be, may be more like Seque lines than, uh, say, I-40. Or, or a large highway today. I'll just now wrap up. I think we're at about that time. Um, sharing a little bit about where this is all heading. So one initiative I'm undertaking is compiling a new database of all known Chacoan roads and what kind of features are along them. What do we know about their destinations? This is updating a, an excellent um, synthesis. The last one done was, was compiled by John Roney in 1992, but we've learned much more, there are many more known roads at this point and we have new technologies. So we're creating a comprehensive database. Um, soon we'll begin OSL studies. I, I won't linger too long. OSL is a technique that measures the last time quartz grains in soil deposits were exposed to sunlight. So if you can go to a location on a Chocoan road with curbing, uh, go out at night, sample the sediment from underneath the curb, send it to a lab that can tell you when that rock was placed and therefore the date of the construction of the road. Because we can date ceramics along roads, but that doesn't tell us when they were built, especially with the intriguing evidence we've been finding that their construction may well precede the, the you know, say, creation of, of masonry multi-storied architecture in Chaco Canyon. I'll continue analysis of ceramics from along the North Road and other 
uh, roads in the Chaco world, but the North Road has such great dense shirred scatters that that'll be the primary focus. We'll of course continue the combined use of LIDAR and structure for motion photogrammetry and ground truthing of roads to keep getting ideas of what, what kind of gates and boxes and 10 room structures are along roads, what are they pointing to on the horizon, et cetera. And finally, continuing, I'm, I'm a big fan of cross-cultural and comparative research. Um, I think it tells us not that everything is the same or that everything is different, but it gives us glimpses into um, what, what makes us human. When you see the same pattern popping up so many places and the cultures haven't been interacting, I think it tells us something about uh, what it means to be human and, and what matters and what gives meaning to people. So continuing to look beyond uh, Chaco and the Southwest to consider roads, not just among the living cultures descended from the Chacoans today, but worldwide societies as well. In closing, I will uh, thank many people, but first I wanna say that the Chaco roads are disappearing rapidly. Um, as many of you know, there's increased there's an increased use of the land in the San Juan Basin, often for energy development, but truly the greatest threat to the Chacoan roads is time. Um, every year they become more subtle. They're eroding roads that could be seen on the ground in the 80s have since uh, lost all ground visibility. And so we need to study the roads now. We're losing them every day. And so that's particularly why I'm so grateful to the um, people and entities listed on this slide for supporting this research. Those who have taught me about roads, my dissertation committee chaired by Scott Ortman, um, in particular the Navajo Nation for helping facilitate our research on their sovereign lands and various funding agencies who've supported this research. So with that, I'm happy to answer questions and thank you all for tuning in. Thank you so much, Rob, for this really interesting presentation. We have quite a number of questions, so uh, I will I will jump right in and uh, and ask a number of them. One one thing that's come up in a couple of places is about you've done a lot of work with looking at descendant communities' thoughts on roads. Um, are you also talking directly and doing consultation with descendant communities on your research um, on roads? We're working most closely with the Navajo Nation because most of our uh, roads research takes place on the Navajo Nation. And um, I think it's really important to bring out many of those Diné perspectives because oftentimes, uh, despite the fact so many Chacoan sites are on the Navajo Nation, their perspectives have um, not received much attention or in fact, uh, statements might be made like the Navajo were not here. And from what I've learned that uh, there are certainly many Navajo clans that were here at that time. So uh, the main sort of direct work with descendant communities is partnering with the Navajo Nation for studying roads on um, Navajo Nation lands. Okay. And uh, yeah, a, a variety of other colleagues as well from, from different pueblos. I, I will share my findings with. Okay. Uh, another question that we that came in is about uh, some of the features of roads. Um, mm -hmm. uh, have you excavated roads to to see if soil structure indicates that it, they've been disturbed, or is that part of any of your research or past research? Great question. Um, we are not excavating any Chacoan roads. Uh, one reason is that. Uh, when the BLM did so, they found there wasn't a whole lot of information to be gained by excavating the roads. They had to use, um, I forget the exact term, but geologic techniques of sort of treating the soil with uh, different substances to be even able to see very subtle stratigraphy. Only in one of the trenches was there evidence that the North Road was sort of repaired and uh, repaired or sort of renovated. And so I don't think there's too much to be learned from excavating roads. And we're so fortunate here in the Southwest, particularly in the San Juan Basin, we're walking on the pre-Columbian surface. So you can see a single course masonry alignment on a road, which is um, truly a, a blessing. I often take for granted. Getting in to look at some of those roads in say Southwest Colorado or Utah, I mean, they're covered in sagebrush. 
Wow. Uh, we have it, you know, the ground is very visible here in the in the basin. Okay. Uh, so sort of in the same lines, there was a, the question about a paving of the roads. Is there any evidence at some point that some of them were paved with like adobe or gravel or anything like that? Great question. Um, the Most of what I know is that image from the Aztec Airport Road. Um, there's certainly uh, this idea of scattering shirts on the road might have been a concept of a pavement, at least I know Jim Copeland has suggested the idea that if you were walking on the road at night with some amount of moonlight, you'd have this sort of gleaming trail of, of white shirts leading you forward. Um, there's been, I think there was some evidence that others might have had a, a clay treatment, but without the, the trenches that were dug, there didn't seem to be a lot of, of paving of the roads. Mainly it's the vegetation is cleared out of the way. Well, excuse me. Sometimes stones are, paste, uh, are placed as curbing alongside. Um, rocks were cleared out of the way. In Chaco Canyon itself on North Mesa, there's a very clear pattern that the roads were, there the roads were swept. The sh if you, uh, Tom Wines did a wonderful job of documenting if you trace where the sherds are on a road on North Mesa, on one edge there's a bunch, and then there's nothing in the middle and another edge, so they were swept off in Chaco Canyon. Of course, sweeping can have so many um, valences beyond quotidian uh, house chores in, in uh, societies around the world, as, as uh, many people, I'm sure, know. Great. Uh, there's a number of questions that are about the sherds along the side of the road. So um, probably four or five questions. So one of them is, why do you think the sherds uh, were intentionally broken into specific sizes? That's a great question. And I'm currently testing that, attempting to test that idea. But the reason why I think is because we've measured almost a thousand shirts on the North Road. And if you make a histogram, there's a huge spike right at two centimeters or two and a half centimeters. So what I'm doing is looking at comparative um, shirt collections from, say, the middens of unit pueblos or other sites and uh, looking to see if there's more variation. Based on just looking on the ground, there seems to be much more variation in, say, a midden deposit in the size of sherds than this high, highly standardized small pieces on chalk and roads. But it's, it's being tested. I may be wrong, and that's, that's, what, that's, what, that's why we uh, investigate and test things and use mm -hmm. uh, more than just looking and, and we use quantitative approaches. Right. Uh, another question along that lines of the sherds is, does the composition of the assemblage at shrines or stairs consist of sherds from many vessels or multiple sherds from a smaller number of vessels? So it's kind of getting at that pot drop question, but I guess asking you to elaborate on why you don't think it's a pot drop. <laughs> um, the ones I've examined, they're, the, the sherds are clearly from different vessels. Okay. So in some cases, of course, you do find a larger sherd that is broken into smaller sherds, and you can see that they're pretty close to each other in their spatial distribution. We also have precise spatial distribution of all these sherds, along with their types and forms and sizes. And so we've also noted in the documentation when, oh, okay, we found this piece over here, and it fits with that piece there. So we've noted clear refit. Um, there's... Some patterns, for example, I haven't examined the, there's some roads on North Mesa that lead to springs in Clyes Canyon. There's some notion that those may be more like pot drops, but again, they're uh, short roads leading to springs and there's overrepresentation of water vessels, oyas on them. Mm -hmm. So again, I mean, I use this phrase sort of jokingly, the clumsy Chocolins model, were they, uh, you know, were they dropping pots over thousands of years and leaving them, or was this an intentional practice? And I will add in the Mystery of Chaco Canyon documentary, I believe it's Ed Ladd from Zuni who talks about, he says something along the lines of when you break and when you break or destroy an object, you take it out of use for those who are living and you make it as an offering to the deceased or those who are um, not living in this realm anymore. And so I think that's 
you know, that's from Ed Ladd's words, in reference to the intentional breakage of ceramics um, evidenced in the Alto Mound. And so I think that's one possible way to understand that. So I wanted to bring in that quote as well. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Um, okay, uh, so Susan says, your presentation makes a compelling case for connecting and, or aligning great houses to features on the landscape. Can you comment on looking back in the other direction from the feature on the landscape to a great house or a settlement? Um, has anybody done sort of looking for any sort of segments that are more at the origin of those important places? Mm. I... I, I haven't gone on top of many of these peaks. Um, I think something close would be Tom Wine's documentation of these so-called uh, wine shrines or J or C-shaped shrines atop many prominent peaks like uh, Cabezon or um, there's, there's, uh, there are human-made rock features on top of many prominent peaks. Anna Sofer and Mike Marshall documented a lot of these as well in the Chaco region. So I wouldn't be surprised, but I also think that in many cases, probably these prominent landforms are still very important to uh, native peoples today. And I wouldn't, uh, I, they probably are active shrines on top of a lot of them. And I don't feel it would be appropriate to try and tie that, uh, those places that are, presumably quite private in, even though there may have been Chacoan features there as well. So that's why I generally look from the great house out. Okay, great, thank you. We have a couple of questions about um, visibility and uh, signaling fires and about that uh, theory about roads and what you think about that, I guess, in general. One of the, you know, specifically Ben asks in Southeast Utah, we have many masonry towers that appear to be providing long distance signaling capability. Any thoughts on whether the Chaco and roads could have served in that function um, as well as things like towers? Great question. Um, signaling fires. I, I, I don't know. Personally, personally, I don't, I don't know. I don't understand personally at this time how signal fires would have worked in the Chaco and world. I say that because the Chaco project did very interesting experiments in the 70s and 80s, lighting flares and you could see each other, but it would have to be a binary communication system. Um, I wonder, you light a fire and then you still have to send a runner with a message. So I don't know why you might not just send a runner in the first place. Um, were the roads facilitating some of those movements? It could be. Um, we Again, we don't see many long distance corridors connecting sites. Uh, I, you know, what's interesting, let's say the, the most prominent fiery feature on a Chacoan road is that Pierre's complex where there's a firebox atop this dramatic towering pinnacle. You could see it from uh, Pueblo Alto probably, I think, I'm sure it's been tested, but I know there are many places along the North Road where you can't see that top of Pierre's. Maybe you could see some kind of an orange glow if there was a fire up there. So I again wonder, um, I would assume, you know, that site probably relates to ritual practices involving fire. Again, very well known among descendant cultures and throughout the ancient world, fire is such a potent um, entity or substance that uh, I often think of, and, and the other sites that are called signaling stations in the Chaka world don't have any evidence of fire. Um, some say they might be using mirrors, but then the sun has to be in a certain place. And uh, again, it would be very hard, I think, to convey like a Morse code. So personally, I think if the Chacoans needed to get a message, they did what the, um, the Pueblos did um, in 1680. Uh, just, you know, we celebrated Pueblo Revolt Day a couple of days ago um, and sent runners. People could travel long distances. And I think... Uh, yeah, I don't want to say it like I'm completely against signaling, but to me, I think communication was probably accomplished through running, and a lot of these high fire features might have had a different use. And sure, maybe they were used for signaling. Great. There, there are a lot more questions, and I don't think we're going to get to all of them, but maybe we could take a nut one more. Maybe, sure. maybe sure. one more. Okay. Uh, sure. 
let's see. Um, how about this one? Where'd it go? From Bruce uh, Hilpert. He's at, he would like to know, he says, you know, the talk really begs the question about real roads. If these aren't roads that are used for transportation, how do the tens of thousands of beams and things that you talked about at the beginning of the talk um, or pots that are coming in from the Chuskas or the tree beams that are coming in from various other places, um, how, how were they transported? Do you just think that those were not needing roadways or any sort of transportation uh, device? Great question. I don't, and I will start by saying, I don't want to say that I think no one ever carried anything on a road. Um, people probably carried stuff on roads sometimes. The, so let's take the example of the West Road, which is the clearest, um, I mean, it goes from Chaco to Skunk Springs on the Chuska Slope. Um, people might have carried trees along it. Uh, some have talked about the nine meter width relating to that, although it confuses me because I think you'd probably carry the log parallel to the road rather than perpendicular. Um, there's a professor at CU Boulder right now who's doing a very interesting study of the, the he's in exercise science of the mechanics of how logs might have been carried, probably with tump lines. Anyway, if you're going west from Chaco Canyon, you could go along the west road. Again, there's some, some sections where it appears there is definitely no formalization of it. I believe that people traveling from the Chuscas to Chaco often would have walked along the Chaco wash, which is rarely wet. It has a very compacted surface, and it's almost like a superhighway heading straight west. Um, they might have used the road, but they might have also used the, the uh, naturally appearing road of the, of the Chaco Wash there, which most of the year, again, is, is a nice, compact walking surface and takes you right to the Chuskas. And uh, it's a least cost path, which I think, you know, water, all those um, courses. So that's, that's my main thought on stuff coming from the Chuskas. Again, it might be on the road. I don't want to, you know, I think getting into dichotomized thinking is one of the major problems we've had in Chaco Roads research. Mm -hmm. like they were they were just ritual or they were just economic. And um, those categories probably made no sense to the Chacoans. But, you know, given my interests and, and the evidence of what I've seen, I think a lot of them do have to do with worldview and relating to uh, other worlds or other mm -hmm. other types of entities. Great. Well, thank you so much, Rob, for this really great presentation. And um, we're not getting to all the questions, but I'll try to save them or maybe Taylor can save them for you so that you can look back and see if there's any other questions you want to address with anybody. There are a number of names I recognize in here that you might also recognize that you could um, perhaps address their questions uh, directly. So sorry yeah. that we didn't get to everyone's questions. <laughs> um, but thank you. Thank you all for joining us today, and please join Crow Canyon for the talk next week on Corrugated Pottery by Genevieve Woodhead. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, so much for tuning in. Best wishes.